And if there's anyone entering the memorial, you're more than welcome to join us for Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday wreath laying. I'd like to just announce that this event is being closed captioned at www.oneinterpreting.com backslash FDR. That's um, where it can be found closed captioned and you can choose English or Spanish. And our event is also being streamed on Facebook Live. Girl Scouts attention, audience attention, will everybody please rise. Color Guard attention, Color Guard advance. Everybody please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard, post your colors. Color Guard, salute your colors. Color Guard dismissed. I am proud to present Miss Mary Dolan, Executive Director, FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. Please take your seats. Thank you to the Girl Scouts for being with us today. Thank you for your presentation of the colors. Thank you all for joining us today. As today is Indigenous Peoples Day, on behalf of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, I want to acknowledge that Washington, D.C. is the traditional territory of the Nacachunk, Anacostan, and Piscataway people. At the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, we acknowledge this legacy and find inspiration from this land. My name is Mary E. Dolan, and I'm co-founder and executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, FDR Committee for short. Just over two years ago, Jane DeLand, Jim Dixon, and I formed this organization so that the disability history of the FDR Memorial would be remembered. We soon expanded our mission to serve as the citizen-led group supporting the FDR Memorial. And we do so by collaborating with the National Park Service to expand education at the memorial, improve accessibility and inclusion, and preserve this great memorial. We are thankful to have Ali Baltris with us today. Ali is the Chief Interpretation and Education uh, Officer, Director. I'm one of those words, and she'll clarify it for me, at the National Mall and, um, and Memorial Parks with the National Park Service. And I'd like to ask Allie to say a few words and also just thank you very much for being with us today. And to Jen Epstein uh, also, and Lorenzo, who's hanging out in the back. So thank you. Allie. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali Balchus, and I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education for the National Mall Sites. And that includes the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial behind me. Um, it is my honor to welcome you on behalf of the National Park Service to today's observance of the anniversary of the birth of Eleanor Roosevelt. 
She would have, was born on this day in 1884. While we are gathered at the memorial to her husband, Franklin, it is an appropriate place to celebrate the life of Eleanor Roosevelt. This is the only presidential memorial that features a statue of the First Lady in honor of her work for the United Nations following her husband's death. Her life was dedicated to public service. She served as a First Lady of the United States from 1933 to 1945. This is the only, um, since Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the only president who had four terms, this makes her the longest serving First Lady in the United States. President Harry S. Truman later called her the First Lady of the World in, her, in tribute to her human rights achievements. While in the White House, she was the first presidential spouse to regularly hold press conferences, to write a newspaper column daily, to do weekly radio shows, and actually to do even a monthly column in a magazine. She spoke at a national party convention, something that hadn't been done before that. And on a few occasions, she publicly disagreed with her husband's policies. She advocated, I'm gonna wait for this plane, Roosevelt advocated for to expand the role of women in the workplace. She advocated for civil rights for African Americans, Asian Americans, and the rights of World War II refugees. Her work and influence continue to be felt across America and throughout the world. And so we want to thank the FDR Memorial Legacy and Mary for, co for sponsoring today's celebration. I'd also like to take the opportunity to welcome our special guests, um, representatives from the Girl Scouts of America, and also Dr. Kirk Adams, President and CEO of the American Federation of the Blind. Both of these organizations were well acquainted with Eleanor Roosevelt. As First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt served as Honorary President of the Girl Scouts during her tenure in the White House, meeting often with Scouts and speaking at their meetings and conventions. Franklin Roosevelt was honorary chairman of the American Federation of the Blind as president. And for the last 25 years of Eleanor's life, she was friends with Helen Keller, who worked for the Federation for more than four decades. In her My Day column, shortly after FDR's death, she recalled how wonderfully Miss Keller and my husband untypified the triumph over physical handicap. So again, thank you all for joining us and for celebrating Eleanor Roosevelt. Happy birthday, Mrs. Roosevelt. Thank you, Allie. Thank you so much. I am, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues at the National Park Service, especially as we near the 25th anniversary of the FDR Memorial in May 2022. So everybody mark your calendars. It's going to be sometime that first week of May 2022. Um, so the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee held the first ever wreath laying at the FDR Memorial on July 26th, just a few months ago, in honor of the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And today is the second ever wreath laying at this memorial, and the first ever here for Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday. And I'm proud that we are setting this tradition in motion. So thank you all for being part of this history in the making. This is no ordinary presidential memorial. This is the only presidential memorial to include a statue of a first lady. Now, just a few weeks ago, the Monument Lab, in partnership with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, released the National Monument Audit, which assessed the current monument landscape across the United States. To no surprise, they found the far majority of monuments across our nation to be male, white, and related to war. While this memorial certainly falls into those categories, it also has unique exceptions. This memorial celebrates the historic contribution 
of Eleanor Roosevelt and what she has done on the world stage by shaping the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the foundation of all international human rights law. The universality of those rights encompass all aspects of human life, including women's rights and disability rights. And thanks to the advocacy of the disability community, the memorial shows a disabled man, just to everybody's right. And millions of people who visit the memorial each year are reminded that leadership includes disabled people. The statue of Eleanor memorializes that leadership is, and always has been, and always will be, and always will include women on all levels of society. And that's why we're here today to celebrate Eleanor Roosevelt's birthday. Woo! Okay. Mrs. Roosevelt did not adopt causes and friends for her own political gain. She saw injustice and lack of equity and opportunity and used her power and position to make a difference. She was a friend and an ally to so many, including to the great Helen Keller, which we will learn about from Dr. Adams. Today, as we celebrate the power of allyship, the ongoing, there is an ongoing need for allies. We gotta have each other's back so that the good work can get done. And who better to celebrate with than with the Girl Scouts of America who have as their mission to build girls of courage, confidence, and character to, who will make the world a better place. It sounds pretty Eleanor-esque to me. Before I invite some of the Girl Scouts to join me in their special presentation, I'd like to acknowledge a few people with us today. Of course, I would like to thank Dr. Kirk Adams. And here comes the airplanes. And we're very thankful that uh, Dr. Adams' wife, Roz, is with us today. Thank you. Welcome, Roz. I'd like to call out, thank you, yep. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Professor Arlene Kingberry from the University of the District of Columbia, who's a wonderful, highly active member of our advisory board of the FDR committee. And we also have another member of our advisory board, the one and only incomparable Senator Tom Harkin. And I did tell the senator I was going to ask him to say a few words. Uh, before I do that, I just want to make sure that the, my team, who helps do so much behind the scenes, they know of my great thanks. So thank you to the team at the FDR Memorial Committee. Thank you to our generous donors, especially the Gordon and Laura Gunn Foundation, and members of all of the advisory board who help bring all of our work together. Uh, so, Senator Harkin, if you wouldn't mind sharing a few words of wisdom about the importance of this memorial and why Eleanor deserves our time and memory and, and, and reminiscences. So, thank you. If you would. Well, Mary Dolan, thank you very much. And thank you for your great leadership of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to serve with you, under you, uh, your leadership, uh, to make sure the FDR memorial uh, continues to be accessible to all and continues to be kept up in the manner in which those of us who voted for it and to establish it. Uh, now, I wasn't there when they voted to actually establish it, but I was there and when we established the statue of FDR in his wheelchair. And that was quite an effort, but everything has succeeded. But I also uh, want to say a few words to the Girl Scouts who are here, because Eleanor Roosevelt was very proud of her being the honorary chair of the Girl Scouts for how many years? Six, uh, be uh, 15 years, I guess, almost 16 years when she was the honorary chair. And I looked back 
and I found the speech she had given on the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Girl Scouts. And so this was 1937. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the speech, but there's one part that I thought was just kind of along the lines that, that Mary Dolan was talking about the Girl Scouts. She was talking about how the Girl Scouts had been working around the White House and how they had done things for her in her work and how tough some of these little jobs were for Girl Scouts at that time. And she said this, um, I couldn't help thinking that they, I mean the Girl Scouts, were learning some very valuable lessons, endurance, tact, and perseverance, and above all, the responsibility of doing something which you have undertaken to do, no matter how tired you may be, nor how difficult it may seem. I know of nothing which is better training for the leadership of the future. So as you can see, even in 1937, she was seeing young women as future leaders of this country and not just as being married to someone else who was going to be a leader. Uh, as Murray said, she, and, and as our uh, park person here, I'm sorry I didn't catch the name completely, said uh, that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was uh, very instrumental both in helping to establish the United Nations, but in establishing the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations. And she became our first, the United States' first delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Uh, she also, interestingly enough, was very instrumental in drafting and writing the Declaration of Universal Human Rights, to which all nations have now signed. And after that, and after it was adopted by all the nations, she appeared before the United Nations. She is the only person, not just woman, the only person to ever get a standing ovation from every single country in the United Nations when she appeared before it after the adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights. No other single individual has ever been accorded uh, that kind of honor by every nation in the world. So for the Girl Scouts who are here today, uh, thank you for being a Girl Scout. Take those words to heart, what Eleanor Roosevelt said, you are our future leaders. There is nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't accomplish. There's nothing you can't be, including President of the United States, by the way. Uh, that, uh, that with your tact, your perseverance, your hard work, you can do it. Uh, so I'm just very proud of you, very proud to be here today to, at this great memorial and to once again see this wonderful statue that we worked so hard on uh, that I was very much involved in. You know, there was quite a controversy on whether or not that statue should be here. And there was a lot of splits uh, being the lead sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act, my legislation, well, I decided to insert myself in this, and I did. It helped that I was on the Appropriations Committee, too. But I can remember meeting once with the, with the uh, uh, commission on this memorial. As you know, there were two dedications. So there was the dedication of the FDR memorial, and then a couple of years later, there was the dedication of the, of the statue of FDR in the wheelchair because it was not in the initial plans. It was added later. But I remember being challenged on this, on why we should have a statue so prominent of the president using a wheelchair. And I said, look, it's not just for persons with disabilities, although it's for that too. 
When a person with a disability comes in there and sees that, they say, wait, you mean someone who was paralyzed all of his adult life did all of that as president of the United States? Well, if he can do that, and maybe I have a disability, but that shouldn't hinder me. If he can do that, why, I, why can't I do great things also? But I said, it's not just for persons with disabilities, it's for persons without disabilities. Think about a temporarily, temporarily abled person. That's what we call them, temporarily able people. Because we can become handicapped at any moment in time. So a person without a disability comes in and sees that. They say, what? Franklin Roosevelt did all of these things, led us through the Great War, defeated Nazism, defeated the Empire of Japan, kept our country, led us out of the Depression, established so many good things that we take for granted today. And he did all that from a wheelchair? Wow. Maybe we ought to look more closely and opening doors and breaking out down barriers for all persons with disabilities. Because who knows what hidden talents are out there that we're not getting because we have erected physical barriers and attitudinal barriers against persons with disabilities. That's why that statue is important, not just for persons with disabilities, but for everybody else, so they can know what it means to succeed under very tough circumstances, under very tough disabilities. So I'm proud to be here today, Mary. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you all for honoring Eleanor Roosevelt on her birthday. Thank you, Senator. I had a feeling that even without, you know, speech writers and, and notes that, that, that you'd nail it. So thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to call up a few members of the Girl Scouts with us today. Okay. I'd like to ask Anaya Kai of Troop 54075 to come on up and join me up here. Uh, Emily Horak of Troop 4720. And Moira Paz Pasa, Troop 4720. Thank you all for coming today. And Anaya, I understand that you are going to tell us about Eleanor Roosevelt and her contribution to the Girl Scouts. Juliet Gordon Lowe once said, truly ours is a circle of friendships united by our ideals. In 1912, Juliet Gordon Lowe, envisioning an organization that would prepare girls to the world with courage, confidence, and character, started Girl Scouts. Known affectionately as Daisy, she gathered 18 girls in Savannah, Georgia to share an outdoor educational movement. These first girls, these first Girl Scouts blazed the trails and refined what was possible for girls everywhere. In 1917, Edith Wilson became the first honorary national president of the Girl Scout movement. This, ha this tradition has continued through this day. In 1933, Eleanor Roosevelt became our, first honorary, became our honorary first president serving Girl Scouting until 1945. In typical Miss Roosevelt's fashion, she was hands-on with every Girl Scout traveling to visit Scouts across the country and even writing about it in her My Day column. In 1937, at a speech for Girl Scouts Silver Jewelby Dinner, Miss Roosevelt said, I could not help but f thinking that possibly the work done with Girl Scouts had suggested the thought of the thought that from these beginnings were to grow leaders amongst young women for the future. Eleanor Roosevelt's impact on Girl Scouts was significant. Her legacy will continue as long as there are Girl Scouts in the world working to make it a better place. Thank you, Anaya. Emily, I understand that you have a column written by Mrs. Roosevelt to share.
Hi, I'm Emily. I'm going to read a column that Miss Roosevelt wrote after she went to a Girl Scout camp. Hyde Park, New York. The roads through Berkshires are always pleasant and not too frequented. The Western Hemisphere Girl Scout encampment near Otis, Massachusetts is situated on a lake with plenty of trees to shade the tents and cabins. When we arrived, the girls representing 24 states and 16 countries had greeted us through three of their representatives, and, their ev and every one passed us by and shook our hands. After this, we started an inspection of the whole camp, which meant walking for nearly an hour and a half, a pleasant activity after the long drive. My cousin, Miss Lemon Delano, went with me, which made the whole day especially enjoyable. She recently resigned as chairman of the committee, which arranges for these international encampments. But she is still vice chairman of, and is neen interesting in scouting. My friends Arthur, Cho Miss Arthur Cho, and Miss Frederick Brook were both there. I saw many other familiar faces. Craft work is carried on in all the tents, and the girls do a great deal of swimming, boating, and hiking. I thought it was particularly good that each unit cooked at least one meal a day and ate it in their own open air dining room, for this gives a chance of familiarity with the outdoor cooking conditions. The girls who lived in what they called the Enchanted Forest, which is a lovely grove of hemlock trees, some distance away from the main building, cooked their own breakfast and supper. Camp Boney Bray has a stable and a number of horses with a very able teacher in attendance. I think this is the only Girl Scout camp I have ever visited where the girls could learn to ride. It has proved so popular that nearly 100 girls signed up for this particular activity. None of them have had as many hours on horseback as would be required for really good acute training. But most of them have learned something about the handling of care of horses and have very good foundation on which to build a future horse, horsemanship. We all launched together in the main building, and I was glad to see Miss Lay White from England, who had visited many other countries in this hemisphere since we met last year. Mayor Puntman of Springfield, Massachusetts, was very kind and drove Miss Delano and I to the city, while the state trooper drove my car. At the broadcasting station, I was presented with a beautiful wooden key to the city. I took it in the broadcast, which, was, which went out to the other groups of Girl Scouts throughout the country, and I think later represented in South and Central American countries. The drive home was most beautiful, in, into a most beautiful sunset sky was unforgettable. I arrived a little bit after 8 o'clock, somewhat wary, but very happy to have taken part in the celebration. Thank you, Emily. Now, Moira, I understand that you have a letter written by a Girl Scout to Mrs. Roosevelt from back in 1941. Dear Miss Roosevelt, yesterday morning I read your column in the Daily News. I thought it was grand. I am a Girl Scout and I thought you would be interested in hearing Camp Osito news including word about the horses they have up there. I attended this summer from July 29th to August 12th. It is situated three miles south of Big Bear Lake, California, elevation 7,000 feet. We left three busloads of girls en route to Aceto at 6 a.m. in the morning. We arrived at Camp Aceto, meaning Little Bear, at 1.30 in the afternoon, and we were served noodle soup, milk, and apricots. From then on, I did so many things, I could not begin to tell you about them. I was assigned to the Manzanitas, meaning Bush, unit. In tent one, there are three tents in each unit, seven girls in each tent, plus the counselor's tent, there are three counselors in each unit. The next Friday, we went horseback riding under the direction of Boots, the riding leader. There are 16 horses, including three new clothes, colts, who, are incidentally, who incidentally are very cute. We went riding, meaning girls of our unit, quite a few times. On Thursday, August 6th, I went on a trail. That was loads of fun. Then Saturday was the greatest event of all, the horse show. 
Everyone turns out for an all-day affair. The girls in three classes, A, B, and C, who wanted to ride, rode in the show. I didn't win anything, though. I was a C. The girls in the class A played musical chairs on horseback. The girl who won this event got a little horse pin. Monday, the day before we left, we, the Manzanitas, went on an all-day hike down three miles to the Big Bear Lake. We took lunches tied to our belts and after eating, had rest hour, and then went to the dock for a lunch trip of two hours. The next day, we left at 2.30 p.m. and got home at 6.05 p.m. Altogether, we had a good time. Someday, maybe you could visit our camp. You'll be warmly greeted, I know. Time is passing fast for both of us, so I will close now. Sincerely yours, Julie Ann Dorr, Troop 112. Thank you, thank you each for those tremendous pieces of history. Get this right. And thank you for your, thank you and your fellow scout, Girl Scouts and a Boy Scout for uh, your participation today. In recognition of all that you and your Girl Scouts do, I want to present you with a gift to remind you of this day and of the great work that we are all called to do. So. Dun, dun, dun. I am holding a rectangular box. Uh, it's purple uh, with plastic in the front. And in it, there is a woman with a hat, uh, a nice wide brimmed hat with a flower and a long printed flowered dress. And I wonder who it could be. <laughs> um, this doll came to us from Mattel. And we are proud to give this to you. And using Mattel's own words, this is the Inspiring Women series. And it pays tribute to the incredible heroines of their time, Barbie. And it honors long, the long-serving, longest-serving first lady of the United States. UN spokesperson and human rights activist, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, a champion of policies around civil and economic rights. Her passionate advocacy was unwavering even when faced with resistance. So, That was wonderful, thank you. I learned a lot. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Kirk Adams, President and CEO of the American Foundation for the Blind. Kirk has been a powerhouse in the disability community for decades. Kirk took over as President and CEO of the American Foundation for the Blind, AFB, in 2016. Prior to that, he was president and CEO of the Lighthouse for the Blind. He is active in his community. Kirk was a member of the Washington State Governor's Task Force on Disability Employment and the Seattle Public Library Strategic Plan Advisory Committee. He served on the boards of the Aerospace Futures Alliance and the Association of Washington Business. Uh, four, three. He was also the treasurer and member of the board of the National Association for the Employment of People Who Are Blind and a board member of the National Industries for the Blind. He received his PhD from Antioch College in Leadership and Change and is the recipient of an honorary doctorate um, from SUNY Upstate Medical University. So he's a doctor doctor. When he was 19, Kirk climbed Mount Rainier in Washington State. 
An article was written about him and his fellow disabled climbers by the Washington Post. And in that article, Kirk is quoted as saying, the point is, if you have a neighbor who is in a wheelchair or blind, the next time you go fishing, ask him to go along. That's why we climbed the mountain. Kirk has spent his life literally and figuratively climbing mountains to make sure that people with disabilities are included in all areas of life. I am honored that Kirk accepted our invitation to speak today. The work of his organization in preserving and archiving the work of Helen Keller is an incredible gift to the world and allows us to continue to learn from her. And today I'm proud to have our ally, Dr. Kirk Adams, with us today. Please welcome Dr. Kirk Adams. Good afternoon. So for those of for those of you who can't see me, I am uh, have a white cane uh, next to me. I have a braille tablet um, on the podium for my notes. I'm a 60-year-old white male with a navy blue suit, a white shirt, a red, white, and blue tie, and I'm going to call it silver hair. <laughs> so um, I am president and CEO of the American Foundation for the Blind, and I'm the sixth president, and I'm the sixth blind president. So we turn 100, we've turned 100 uh, this year on September 23rd. So for 100 years, we've, we've worked hard each and every day to create a world of no limits for people who are blind. And Eleanor Roosevelt was a big part of that. If you go to afb.org slash 100, you'll find some terrific uh, centennial content that I hope you will all enjoy. Helen Keller was our global brand ambassador for 44 years. And she had a long and mutually rewarding relationship with Mrs. Roosevelt. Helen was born in 1880. She passed away in 1968. Eleanor was born on this very day in 1884. And she passed away in 1962. So they were very much contemporaries. And for over 30 years, they had regular interactions and they provided each other with active mutual support and advocacy for inclusion. So Helen bequeathed her estate to us, to AFB in 1968 when she passed away. And we have digi digitized 88,000 items that she left behind, her, her correspondence, her manuscripts, her drafts. So at afb.org, slash Helen Keller archive, there's a searchable database. And if you uh, type Eleanor Roosevelt into the search box, you'll see how involved Mrs. Roosevelt was in advocating for inclusion of people with disabilities with Helen and with AFB. AFB founded in 1921, hired Helen Keller in 1924, and at that time she was the most recognized person with a disability in the world, and, and she remained so. And she had a lot of influence, and she used it to affect a lot of positive systems change. In uh, February 19th, 1933, that's the first letter that we have uh, in the archive that she wrote directly to Eleanor Roosevelt, and she wrote, Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, we have met only twice for a moment, but I have been drawn to you by your earnest, constructive efforts in behalf of the unprivileged. And since election day, I have felt the bond of sympathy grow stronger and stronger between us. I cannot tell you with what pride and satisfaction I have followed your courageous activities. Your talks over the radio have in them the ring of conscience and vision. Like all the world, I shall be thinking of you and our new president on March 4th. Already the national atmosphere is clearer and brighter because of you both. A good man with the best intentions cannot fail to bring much good to pass. Mingled with my hope for the nation is the wish, always present in my mind, 
that the blind who still abide in the dim forests of our days may share in the light of your coming. This desire emboldens me to make a request that either at the inaugural ceremony or at the ball that evening, you wear a corsage as a token of the affectionate regard of the blind of America. If you grant this request, I shall be most happy to know your favorite colors and have Max Schling make up a bouquet suitable to the occasion. The very thought of your wearing the flowers would gladden the hearts of the blind. It would be a gesture never forgotten by those who appreciate a beautiful deed. You have always listened to the needs of the humblest with ministering tenderness, and in wishing to have you include the sightless in the circle of your benevolence, I am only asking the rose to give of its own fragrance. For my part, my heart and hopes are all with Mr. Roosevelt and you on the eve of what I believe will be a great and splendid administration. With respect and affection, I am Helen Keller. Oh, now that's a letter, right? So in, in 1949, Helen gave a speech to the American Women's Voluntary Services, uh, recognizing Mrs. Roosevelt's great achievement, the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in part, her speech, she said, Already we are electrified by the news that through the patient exertions of Eleanor Roosevelt and other woman members of the United Nations, the Declaration of Human Rights has come into being. The fact that it has been signed is a witness to the imperishable forces of good. Here is an opportunity for women everywhere to unite in a crusade of light that shall make the Declaration of Human Rights known to every people. Here is a means for we American women to work towards a peace that shall not again be broken by a reviving barbarism and enslavement. Then will our destiny, then will our destiny be fulfilled to refashion the world through the triple influence of education, liberty, and the might of the spirit. In 1965, three years after Eleanor Roosevelt passed away and three years before Helen Keller would leave us, there were 20 women elected to the Women's Hall of Fame at the World's Fair in New York. There were 100 nominees, and the top two vote-getters were Helen Keller and Eleanor Roosevelt. So they're forever bound together in advocacy for the inclusion of people with disabilities. I share my personal gratitude in particular for the work they did together to create the National Library Service for the Blind. Uh, to, to provide literature to blind people. AFB created the talking book in the early 1930s, and Eleanor and Helen did the rest. They advocated with Congress to create and fund the Library Service for the Blind. Um, my retina is detached when I was five years old in uh, kindergarten, so I became uh, went from a sighted child to a blind child in, in just a few days. Uh, my mom signed me up for the National Library Service. I remember the first talking book that came. It was Harold and the Purple Crayon. And I learned Braille in first grade at the Oregon State School for the Blind, and I read Braille materials from the National Library Service every single day of my life. And I'll be eternally grateful to Eleanor and Helen for making that happen. I did want to let you all know that um, the 35th season of American Masters on PBS is going to conclude with a documentary called Becoming Helen Keller. It'll premiere on PBS on October 19th at 9 p.m. And uh, AFB was very pleased to make the Helen Keller archives available to the, uh, the filmmakers. So an another chance for you to learn about Helen. And it's just been wonderful sharing this time uh, with all of you, in particular the Girl Scouts today. Courage, confidence, and character. Are there any thin mints in the house? <laughs> and it's just such a pleasure to uh, speak with Senator Harkin. Uh, sir, you are a true giant in the history of disability rights. 
and it was great to reminisce with you about the popcorn machine and your Senate office, and I, uh, I look forward to visiting the Harkin, in Harkin Institute at Drake University in Des Moines. So thank you for everything you've done. And it's been a true honor to be part of today's ceremony. Thank you so much to Mary Dolan, Professor King Barry, and the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. Thank you to Allie and the National Park Service for including the American Foundation for the Blind. We're, we're so very proud to be included in this sacred trust of honoring Eleanor Roosevelt and her legacy of tireless, tireless advocacy for justice and inclusion of people with disabilities. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Kirk Adams. That was fantastic. Every time I talk to you or someone at AFB, I learn more and more about Helen Keller and um, we all have our work cut out before us to continue learning from her and her incredible work. So thank you for that contribution to, to the world. Okay, the moment we've been waiting for. Um, I would like to ask um, Ari Paspasa and Ava Lake to step forward, please. They're going to join Dr. Adams um, and Senator Harkin as we process to place the wreath at the statue of Eleanor Roosevelt. The statue is on the very far end of the memorial. Um, we're going to ask you to sit tight, everyone else, to sit tight for a moment or two so that we can get a bit of a head start um, per regulations from the Park Service. Um, but we will then, uh, you'll be given a signal for when you may join us and uh, we have flowers that you're invited to take. Um, actually, we have someone who's going to distribute the flowers and present, you may take one and present it at the statue. So. Um, so why don't I get uh, Dr. Kirk Adams, Senator Harkin. I'll leave this. 